Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 116, and we're going to cover 1 Kings chapters 12 and 13. Last time we left off, Solomon had multiplied the gals. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But we also saw that his house would be divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And Solomon dies at the end of chapter 11. And as we pick up in chapter 12, we're going to see his son, Rehoboam. And it's interesting how the kingdom divides. Let's look at chapter 12. It's going to break down how it us. Verse 1, then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt, where he had fled from the prisons of King Solomon. Then they sent and called him to Jeroboam, and all the assemblies of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he has put on us, and we will serve you. Then he said to them, Depart for three days, then return to me. So the people departed. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me to answer this people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to the people today and serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the load which your father has put on us? The young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now you make it lighter for us. But you shall speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I would discipline you with scorpions. And so, we'll, so what we have here is at the beginning of Rehoboam's reign, he has a decision to make. And the people come to him saying that the father had a heavy yoke on him. And the yoke here is taxes. So Rehoboam's father Solomon was taxing the people a little too heavy, and they wanted some relief. So Rehoboam seeks counsel. First, he goes to the elders, and they say, look, if you relieve the taxes, these people will serve you forever. It'll be a blessing to them. Then he goes to his peer group, and they say, nah, listen, don't lighten the yoke. Make it heavier on them. And Solomon listens to his peer group. So basically what you have here is the taxes are being imposed on the people. And instead of lightening the tax, Rehoboam wants to send an ancient form of the IRS to collect more taxes, to make it more burdensome on them. And instead of submitting to the IRS, they want to kill him. But also, what's the moral here as well? Rehoboam doesn't listen to older godly counsel. This is why we need older men in our lives to speak into our lives. And we need to listen to them if they have the wisdom of the Lord. These older men had wisdom on how to help Rehoboam lead, but he wouldn't listen. He wanted to listen to his peer group, and that's the blind leading the blind. And so we see that the kingdom is splitting, and it can't be put back together. The only person that can put the kingdom back together is God. And so from this point on, everything will just self-destruct. We're about to see a downward spiral all throughout the kings. And what's going to happen here, and you got to pay close attention to this, the kings are going to move back and forward from the northern and southern kingdom. And so we'll have to keep track of which king we're referring to and talking about because this is intentional. The author is going to compare and contrast each of the kings from each region. And so the kingdoms are divided. If you look in verses 17 and following, it says, But as the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adarim, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot and flee to Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. It came about when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. But none of the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Now notice verse 21. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah 
and the tribe of Benjamin. And that's something that we'll have to take note of because the tribe of Benjamin is with Judah because remember 10 are divided, but it's 12 tribes. So that leaves two. And so you'll see that Benjamin will have split loyalty in the land during this divided era. And as you can see here, the tribe of Benjamin was included with the house of Judah. But we'll see even later that some of the towns of Benjamin will go with the northern kingdom. And you would think that because God has given Jeroboam the kingdom, the 10 tribes, the northern kingdom, that he will be humbly submissive. Not quite. Look at verse 28. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel and he put the other in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made priests from among all the people who were not the sons of Levi. And so just like Exodus 22 with the golden calves, you see the idolatry of Jeroboam. And it reminds you of the spirit. Remember back in Joshua, the people wanted to stay on the east side of the Jordan and they erected an altar just saying it was for a memorial. Look at what Jeroboam says. It's, it's too much for us to go back to Jerusalem. Behold, these are your gods. And that's what it always ends in, idolatry, when you don't listen to the voice of the Lord. And he's, and this is what's going to be typical of the Northern Kingdom. They're not going to have any stability and they'll never have a dynasty continue because they don't trust in the Lord. So mostly all of your Northern Kings are wicked, but the Southern Kingdom is going to have a few righteous Kings, but most of those will be wicked as well. And we, and so we move into chapter 13, and this is an interesting chapter. It starts off by saying, now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. While Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense, he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you and human bones shall be burned on you. And so there you have it. So you have a prophecy here that King Josiah will be raised up. And this is how accurate the Bible is. This is a prophecy that doesn't happen for about another 300 years. And it's predicted that he would kill all the illegitimate priests and tear down the high places. And so in the rest of the chapter here in chapter 13, you get a man of God who's a prophet who comes to Jeroboam and tells him what's going to happen. He even names him by name, Josiah. Look for him. He shows him a sign with leprosy. And now the king wants to have him over for dinner. And he says, no, I can't come or I will die. Now in verse 11, an older prophet comes along and says, I have a word from God. And he told you to come have lunch with me. And so what do we learn here? is that this is a test. Why? Because God's word doesn't contradict itself. And so the man buys in and listens. And it says in verse 20, now it came about as they were sitting down at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah saying, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord and have not observed the commandments, which the Lord your God commanded you, but you have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread or drink no water. Your body shall not come to the grave of your fathers. And it came about after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, he saddled his donkey for him and the prophet whom he had brought back. Now, when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him and his body was thrown on the road and a donkey standing beside it and a lion was standing beside the body. It's a lot going on here. The reason this chapter is so weird, because it's very important. What's about to happen here is we're about to get an influx of prophets because the kings have been disobedient. God is now about to raise up another entity at a high level called the prophets. And so this is the introduction of the prophets. 
So don't forget 1 Kings chapter 13. Your kings are disobedient. Now God is about to raise up another office. Now prophets were always there in the Old Testament. Even Abel is considered a prophet from Genesis 4. Just like Nathan, they're all throughout the Bible, but now they're about to be raised up and we're about to see them over and over to rebuke the people of Israel and to rebuke the king. And we're going to see the increase of this phrase here, the word of the Lord. And it's interesting because the word of the Lord is going to start doing stuff. It's going to take on personification. The word of the Lord is going to come to someone. The word of the Lord is going to do this. The word of the Lord is going to do that. And what that should do in your mind is, is because the Old Testament is personifying the word of the Lord, it shouldn't be hard for you when the word of the Lord comes in the New Testament and takes on flesh because the Old Testament is prepping you with the language that it's using here right now. And so what you have here is now the prophet is dead. He's lying down. There's a lion there and there's a donkey there next to this dead guy. And this is a weird scene. The lion killed the man, but he's laying there right by him. And a donkey is there too. The lion's not eating the donkey. Neither is the lion eating the man. And this makes no sense. But this proves to you that this is the power of the word of God. God's word does not contradict itself. And God will now rule by his word. And you will see an increase in intensity of the word of the Lord. And I'll try to point that out for you. So the kings do stuff, but who's going to really have the power from here on out? It's going to be the prophets. God, after Solomon, he's showing you that his kings aren't holding up to Deuteronomy 17. No gold, no gals, no giddy up. Writing a copy of my word, keeping a copy of my word, and reading it all the days of their lives and obeying it. So I'm going to have to raise up my own men called the prophets to execute my judgments and to deliver my word and to display my power. And that's what we are about to see now. Things are getting exciting. We move from the patriarchs to the leaders like Moses and Joshua, to the judges, to the kings, to the major kings. And we'll still cover some kings. And now we're about to enter into the rise of the prophets as we continue to talk about the king. And now you're getting theology as well because God rules through his word. And if you zoom forward to the New Testament, in the beginning was the what? Was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And you needed first Kings to crack the code of the book of John chapter one. That, that would never make sense to you if you didn't understand the Kings. Now you will meet the true King who is the embodiment of the word. And that's what Kings is setting us up for. You guys take care. Catch you next time and have a good day.